Hi there, so in this video we're going to have a quick recap of the different approaches to managing seismic hazards and we're going to have a look at a few approaches such as prediction and protection and preparedness. If we start by considering how we might go about predicting an earthquake, there are various bits of technology that can be used to try and detect very subtle changes in the Earth's crust. Uh, we can monitor perhaps changes in the rise and fall of the ground level using satellite imaging. We can detect changes in the level of the water table. We can detect changes in the release of a gas called radon. Um, this is a gas that's released from rocks within the earth when they're put under pressure and a rise in the level of radon in the soil can often be an indication that an earthquake is about to happen. We can also look at changes um, in the magnetic fields um, surrounding an area which is about to experience an earthquake um, and of course small earthquakes could be um, the precursor to a larger earthquake event. We might also be able to detect um, using some kind of laser level across a fault line any subtle changes in the movement of one part of a fault line relative to another. Authorities could then use this information to inform residents through public broadcasts, um, alerting them to the danger and start to um, evacuate people. And that was evidenced um, in Haicheng in China. Um, 90,000 people were evacuated um, in advance of what turned out to be a magnitude 7.3 earthquake um, that destroyed 90% of the city's infrastructure. So that's a good example of where um, prediction has worked in terms of actually helping to save lives. Um, however, the effectiveness um, of earthquake prediction or monitoring systems is very, very limited. And the reason being is because much of the evidence is very anecdotal. Lots of the changes in perhaps the, the water table or um, in terms of small earthquakes preceding a larger quake um, or changes in the Earth's magnetic field, they tend to be observed after the event. So we don't have reliable, repeatable indicators that we can use um, reliably to predict earthquakes. And indeed, you could argue that being able to predict an earthquake is not actually going to be that useful. Um, if you were to have to evacuate a whole city, um, as was the case in, in Haicheng in China, that's going to have huge disruptions to um, the economy. And if that earthquake turns out not to happen, then um, there might be some distrust in the government or uh, the scientists providing that kind of advice. So ultimately, maybe predicting earthquakes isn't exactly what we want to be doing anyway. Maybe we just need to accept that they are going to happen. And when they do happen, there are other techniques that we can use to help limit the damage. Um, quite famously, following an earthquake in Italy, um, in the town of L'Aquila in 2009, um, six scientists and a government official were actually jailed um, for giving overly reassuring advice um, in the build up to that earthquake. So in a press conference, they were pushed as to whether or not an earthquake was likely to happen. They said it was unlikely. Um, and then the town was hit by a sizable um, magnitude seven earthquake, which um, went on to kill um, a few hundred people. And they were sent to jail for um, giving that advice. So it's perhaps also um, you know, quite dodgy ground that we might find ourselves on if we're trying to make these kind of predictions based on relatively weak evidence. What we can do though is give early warnings to populations that an earthquake has occurred um, but the shaking just hasn't reached that location yet. Um, we can see in this example here um, that where we have an earthquake, um, we've got, imagine the epicenter of the earthquake is at this point here, and moving out from that epicenter, we have P and S waves. Okay, the P waves you'll remember travel more quickly than the S waves. So even though both of these waves are released at the same time, the P wave might reach this sensor, maybe it's seismometer, it will reach that first. This seismometer will be able to detect the arrival of that P wave. Um, it will send a transmission 
to this alert center and then that alert center would pass that message on to people's mobile phones or make broadcasts on um, maybe on the television and it would be able to do that in a matter of seconds giving people 20 to 30 seconds warning um, that the earthquake is on its way. The same principle can be applied to tsunami whereby equipment in the sea, either buoys floating on the surface of the ocean or sensors on the seabed, can detect the pressure changes associated with tsunami and that can transmit information um, via satellite back to a monitoring station. So for example, if we take the um, case of the Pacific Ocean um, in Hawaii, right in the center of the Pacific Ocean, that's where um, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center is based and they are responsible for monitoring um, the presence of tsunami in the Pacific Ocean and sending out alerts um, to countries that border the Pacific um, in the event of an earthquake which triggers a tsunami. So early warning can be very, very useful in terms of giving some prior warning to countries that um, an earthquake or a tsunami is on its way. When we think about um, how we can go about constructing buildings um, in order to withstand earthquakes, probably the first thing we need to think about is some form of land use planning. So um, the map on the top left here is one that's compiled by um, the US Geological Service. Um, and they've put together a map which shows the frequency um, of damaging earthquake shaking um, that could potentially occur across different parts of the USA. And we can see that certain areas such as um, California along the west coast um, of the USA um, is particularly prone to severe earthquakes. So it would be important in that area to be able to control the construction of buildings and making sure that um, buildings are built um, to a specific standard. If we think on an even smaller scale, um, then we can use what are called shake maps. Again, these have been compiled by um, the US Geological Survey and they look at the shaking that might occur in a city or region following um, a, an earthquake scenario. So for example, if we were to have um, an earthquake epicenter here um, in California, um, just north of San Francisco, how would the shaking um, be varying across that region? And we can see along the fault line down towards um, San Francisco and Santa Cruz here, that's where the shaking would be most intense. So again, rather than just thinking specifically about California um, as a sort of state wide level, we can think actually down to um, a much more localised level in terms of which areas might be worse affected by an earthquake in a particular location. Um, while in an ideal world land use planning can help to ensure that we're not constructing buildings um, in earthquake prone areas or certainly buildings that are going to fall down, it is really difficult to achieve um, in developing countries, particularly where there are rapid rates of urbanisation. Um, in these countries, very often poverty is causing rapid rural to urban migration. People are moving to cities um, in very large numbers and that's happening so quickly that the local authorities can't control the construction of houses and urban sprawl happens um, very rapidly and migrants are often constructing their houses potentially illegally if, if we think about the case of squatter settlements um, on land that is perhaps unsuitable to be constructed on or certainly using construction techniques that don't meet the required planning standards. So in developing countries land use planning can be limited um, by poor governance. On the other hand though we can think about um, specifically how buildings can be constructed so that they are so-called life safe. A good quote that we perhaps come across quite often when we think about earthquakes is this one at the top here, that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. And if we want to think about reducing the number of deaths in an earthquake and even the amount of economic damage, then we really do need to pay attention to the construction of buildings.
We can think about um, aspects of their foundations, so perhaps shock absorbers built into the foundations or sinking those foundations into very deep, um, solid bedrock. We can think about the, the structure of the building itself, so perhaps um, a steel frame that interlocks and, and uses triangular shapes to give the building some rigidity, but equally also allowing some flexibility for it to move um, with the shaking of the earthquake. Some very tall buildings even have um, computer controlled weights at the top of them um, and they act to counterbalance the movement of the building. So if the building sways one way, the weight will move to another, um, the other side of the building to help reduce the impact of that shaking. We can think about maybe automatic window shutters to prevent um, the falling glass or, or constructing the building out of fire resistant materials. Um, and even thinking about the planning of the areas surrounding buildings. So having open areas where people can assemble if they have to evacuate that building um, and having roads which are going to provide quick access for emergency vehicles and making sure those roads and bridges themselves aren't um, going to collapse or be damaged in an earthquake. Some limitations of this approach though is um, evident in the form of corruption. So in some societies that corruption which usually takes the form of bribes to officials um, can allow buildings to be constructed that don't meet the required building codes. There was um, a magnitude 8 earthquake in, in Sichuan in China in 2008 and following that earthquake um, there was an investigation into uh, corruption of officials um, who'd been constructing um, or passing the, the, the plans to construct schools in the region that was affected by the earthquake and many of these schools collapsed in the earthquake even though they should have been built um, to a high enough standard to withstand the shaking that they experienced. Um, the problem as well arises when we think about buildings which already exist. So um, many of our cities, we can't just simply knock them down and, and start again. We have to think about finding ways that we can um, so-called retrofit the buildings and infrastructure that exists already. Um, that's never as effective as constructing them correctly um, in the first instance. And um, Again, in, in California in 1994, following the Northridge earthquake, um, many buildings and highways that had been strengthened and retrofitted um, were badly damaged. Yet the newly constructed um, earthquake resistant or life safe buildings in the same area remained relatively undamaged. We also have to consider the fact that this adds an extra cost to the construction of buildings and that may, might be in the developing world a reason why people are keen to try and bypass some of these building codes. The final thing that we consider as a method of managing seismic hazards is the approach of preparedness. So thinking about measures that we can take in advance of an earthquake, which is going to limit the damage and help that people are prepared and know what to do um, in the event of an earthquake or tsunami. In the USA, they have uh, this earthquake drill every year called the Great Shakeout. Um, and that is practiced um, in October. Um, people in, in homes and schools and businesses um, practice their earthquake preparedness drills just in the same way um, that in the UK we might practice a fire drill on um, a regular basis. There will be public awareness campaigns and people are um, educated in the action that they should take if they find themselves in an earthquake. So in the USA they use this phrase drop cover and hold on. We can see it outlined um, at the bottom of this poster down here actually, the idea that people drop to the floor, they take cover perhaps under a table um, and then they hold on to that table as well and, and stay there until the earthquake has stopped. Um, people are also educated in terms of perhaps things they can prepare before the event of, of an earthquake. So um, go bags in particular are bags that people can put together which contain uh, the essential supplies that people might need if they have to evacuate from their home. Um, it's important that people have got that 
somewhere um, to hand that they can just grab if they do need to leave their house. And we can see on this um, advertisement here the sorts of things that people would be expected to put in there. So some first aid materials, um, some um, toiletries, some emergency tools like a whistle or um, a torch, uh, maybe some goggles or um, important documents and money, making sure that people have maybe got a copy of their passport and their birth certificate um, and a small supply of food and water, um, and maybe some, some clothing and a blanket that's going to see them through perhaps the, the first 24 to 48 hours before um, the support mechanisms kick in. The problem with some of these approaches um, is that drills can become boring and repetitive um, and uh, in the worst case even breed a bit of a false sense of security. We see this perhaps when um, a fire alarm goes off in school. Our first thought when we hear that fire bell is that it's a drill. We don't ever think that it's that it could be a real fire. Um, and the danger is that people get a little bit complacent and they just get used to hearing um, earthquake alerts or tsunami warning sirens, um, yet they're never followed by an earthquake or a tsunami. Um, so that can be quite uh, damaging to the, you know, the efforts to prepare people if populations are becoming complacent. The other issue, particularly in less developed regions, is about access to technology. So how you're actually educating people about um, what to do and obviously people's levels of literacy or um, language barriers can also um, prevent people from accessing some of the messages that governments might be trying to give out. So we've looked there at various different approaches to managing seismic hazards. It's not a case that we would want to prioritise one of those approaches. We want to think about having a holistic combination of land use planning and protection and preparedness and early warning systems, which can all work together in order to reduce the death, destruction and damage caused by seismic events.